Well, all right, everyone. I think I'm going to go ahead and get started here. I hope that you can hear me all right and that you can see my screen, uh, hopefully in clear resolution today, so far anyway. Um, and I hope that you guys are doing okay. We are uh, kind of in the home stretch for the semester at this point. And um, today I'm going to cover section 9.5. I'm going to just jump right in and do that at the beginning today. It's the second to last section that we have to cover for this semester. Uh, so we're gonna get that covered today. Uh, the very last section that we're gonna cover will be next week after your midterm. So uh, we'll worry about that one later. But um, yeah, so uh, I'm gonna cover section 9.5 today, which will be included on your midterm that's next Tuesday. Uh, after I cover section 9.5, uh, sort of the second half of our class today, uh, I'll have plenty of time to talk about the midterm. Uh, I'll talk about um, sort of what you should be studying and what the resources are and how the exam is going to, to be structured, all of that. Um, and then we'll do some group work to practice some of this material in chapter nine, uh, except we won't do it as group work. I'm probably just gonna, gonna run us through the, the problems. Um, and then uh, I'll also take questions on the, the homework that you're currently working on. So uh, just to remind you, there's nothing due today. The, the homework that you're currently working on is going to be due on Saturday. Uh, and the reason it's not due till Saturday is that half of that homework assignment involves the material that I'm about to explain right now. So uh, we haven't learned it yet, and I want to make sure you have a couple of days to, to practice it for the homework. So, so that's kind of uh, the, the way I'm going to lay out today's class. But I'm going to start the first part of today's class with getting that material covered that uh, we haven't quite covered yet. I want to get that out of the way. And then we'll uh, have plenty of time to, to cycle back and, and talk about the midterm and so on. Okay, hopefully that sounds like a good game plan to you guys. Uh, but let's go ahead and get started here. I've got a summary on the board of a lot of the stuff we talked about on Tuesday. So um, we're trying to solve, of course, this is our linear system. And I've expressed it in this super compact form where we have the derivative of x vector equals a times x, okay? And a is just a square matrix. And because it's a square matrix, we can try to find its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. And as we saw on Tuesday, miraculously, if we use the eigenpair for the matrix, we can build a solution to our system up here. So here's the way we do it. We just take e to the lambda t times v. And that becomes a solution to our linear system. All right. Now it is possible that the eigenvalue eigenvector pair could be complex. We could have complex numbers in there. And we did uh, an example of that also on Tuesday. If the eigenpairs are complex, it is a little bit more complicated than just writing e to the lambda t times v. Instead, you actually have to floy it out, okay? You have to actually put the eigenvalue lambda here in complex form, put the eigenvector here in complex form, and then floy it out. And I'll just um, leave it at that for now. Uh, but if you uh, need practice on that, of course, the homework for Saturday is going to give that to you, uh, and you're going to find lots of practice problems on that. There probably will be an example on the midterm with complex numbers. So you should make sure you know how to address this uh, Floy process and to, to do it correctly, okay? It's not hard. It's just it's a little bit of a, it's a few steps of calculation, right, to get the right answer. Once we've assembled all of these uh, eigenvalue eigenvector pairs, we can build the general solution to our linear system in the manner that I've expressed right here in this box, right? So x of t is just linear combinations of the n individual solutions that we have built right here in this box uh, using the eigenpairs, 
okay? So using the eigenvalue, eigenvector pairs of the matrix, we can build all of these solutions on the right-hand side of that equal sign. As usual, we just put them into a linear combination and we've got our general solution, okay? Hopefully all of that is so far so good for everybody. Feel free to interrupt me with questions. You can unmute yourself and just ask a question straight out, uh, or you can type a question into the Zoom chat. Uh, I'll be happy to, to clarify anything that I can, okay? So it's pretty simple. We just take the matrix, we find the eigenpairs, and we build the solutions into a linear combination. If necessary, we do the whole Freud process to handle any complex eigenvalue, eigenvector pairs that might show up, okay? I spent a little bit of time in the last part of class on Tuesday talking about the two by two matrix situation specifically because we can actually draw pictures, it's something called a phase portrait, and we can draw pictures that show the different solution curves. Remember, of course, there are going to be infinitely many solutions to our linear system. And unless we are given initial conditions, uh, those infinitely many solutions are all, are all valid, right? So and in particular, you see that you have different constants, C1, C2, C3, and so on, that are gonna give you those infinitely many different solutions. And we can draw them on a phase portrait. And I drew uh, a, an example in detail of a saddle point on Tuesday. So if one of your lambdas is positive and one of them is negative, you get a saddle point, okay? But you can also get other things, right? If, if both of your lambdas are positive, we'll get what's called a source. If both of the lambdas are negative, our phase portrait is going to look like a sink. Okay, so saddle, source, and sink, depending on the eigenvalues and whether they are positive or negative. We could also have, you know, a pair of complex eigenvalues. And in that case, we really have to look at the real part of that complex number, the A part, right? So the A is right here, the real part of the complex number. Depending on whether that's greater than zero, less than zero, or equal to zero, we're gonna have some kind of a, like a spiral either an unstable spiral, this is a spiral that goes outward from the origin point, or we could have a stable spiral, which tends to cycle towards the origin. Or if A is equal to zero, we just trace out a periodic behavior that just retraces over and over itself endlessly, and that's just called a circle. Okay, so we have six different types of phase portraits. And I want you guys to be able to decide if I give you a matrix, a two by two matrix A, and we consider the solutions to the linear system, I would like to know whether the phase portrait that shows those solutions is a saddle, a source, a sink, an unstable spiral, a stable spiral, or a circle, okay? Notice that to decide that, you only need to know the lambdas. You don't have to have gone through the whole process of solving the system. You just need those eigenvalues, okay? So yet again, eigenvalues are playing a very important role, um, not only in linear algebra, but now in the differential equations that we're studying here at the end of the semester. Okay, so this is just a quick recap of what we did on Tuesday. Does anybody have any questions for me so far on what we've said? here on the whiteboard. Okay, we're gonna practice some of this in a group work uh, later on today after we take a break um, later into the class period. But uh, for right now, I'm, I'm gonna move forward. You see, this general solution has N terms in it. And that's because the matrix is an N by N matrix. So we're going to have an n-dimensional solution set. If we can come up with n linearly independent eigenvalue eigenvector pairs, this is gonna be no problem. And on all of the examples we did on Tuesday, we had no problems, right? 
But the question that you might be thinking about is, what if the matrix is defective? What if we cannot make n solutions that look like this and get n linearly independent basis solutions? This is a possible problem. And this is what we're going to address in the first half of our class today, is how do we handle the situation when the matrix is defective? So let me um, create some room for myself to talk about that. Again, we'll come back to this recap stuff later when we do a little bit of group work. But for right now, I'm going to cover section 9.5. 9.5 is called defective, defective capital A. What if my matrix A that I'm starting with is actually defective? So that's, that's going to be the, the question. Okay. So this is a little tricky, and I actually like the way that I'm going to explain it in the notes right now better than what's in the book. So I would, I would recommend focusing on my notes, especially for this, okay? So let me set up uh, an example here to get us started. Let's suppose I ask you to solve x1 prime equals negative 2x2 and x2 prime, just put a little comma between them here, x2 prime equals 2x1 plus 4x2. I'm just going to remind you that when we take derivatives here, anywhere on the board where you see derivatives is always with respect to t. So I don't see a t written down very many places on the board, but everything is functions of time in chapter 9. Okay, so this is x1 of t prime equals negative 2x2. Now, once again, I pulled a little stunt on you that I did on Tuesday as well. Oh, you can't hear me? Can you guys hear me okay? I can. Let me turn my volume all the way up. Okay. Hopefully that's a little better. Okay, good. Thank you. Um, Reza, I hope that's better. Maybe, uh, turn your volume all the way up. I've got mine all the way up on my computer here. Okay, great. Okay, perfect. Thanks, guys. Um, I pulled a little stunt on you again that I did on Tuesday, which is that I did not give you the system as a matrix equation yet. So the first thing that we have to do is we have to write down the matrix, right? We have to get this formatted as a matrix system. So of course, to do that, I'm just going to, for the solution, I'm just going to write x vector prime. So this is just the x1 prime and the x2 prime on the left side. And when I make a matrix out of this, I'm going to put the x vector over here. I have to look at the numbers that I see in these equations, and that's how I'm going to fill in the matrix. I pulled a little bit of a trick here, too, because notice that there's no x1 term on the first equation. So that means there's a 0 in the upper left corner and then a negative 2. That's because of this negative 2 that goes right there. For the x2 prime, I have coefficients of 2 and 4. So this becomes the matrix that we're looking at, OK? This is capital A right here, OK? So just make sure that you're able to do that. You're going to need to be able to take a system and put it into the matrix representation of it, OK? So we've got our setup. So the very first thing that we're going to do is try to find our eigenpairs, right? So for each eigenpair, we're going to be able to make solutions to our system. So let's do this. We're going to take the determinant of the matrix that we get when we subtract lambda from the main diagonal. OK, so I'm going to subtract the lambda off of the main diagonal, just like we usually do. When you work this out, you're going to get lambda squared plus 4 lambda plus 4 equals 0. Okay, it's just a quadratic equation. We can just use AD minus BC, the usual determinant formula for a two by two. 
And this just factors as lambda plus two squared equals zero. And so my lambdas are just negative two repeated twice, right? So we're gonna get lambda equals negative two and negative two. By the way, does that mean that this matrix is defective? Just that information alone? It does not, right? Remember that it's okay for an eigenvalue to repeat as long as it pulls its weight. So here we have an eigenvalue that has a weight of two. So I'm gonna need to check whether it pulls that weight. And that's where the null space comes in, right? So I'm gonna do the null space. And this is where we, we replace, um, you know, uh, we basically add two to the main diagonal of this matrix right here. So when we do that, we're going to get, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Um, Professor, I think it's- um, I messed up. I realize I messed up. What, sorry, what's, the, what's your comment? Gustavo, you see the oh, mistake? I think it's negative four lambda instead of positive. Yeah, yeah, I just, I just caught that because I was looking at my null space and I was like, this isn't gonna work right. Yeah, I made a little typo here, guys. This should have been, this should have been lambda squared minus four lambda. Can we please fix that? I'm so sorry. Lambda squared minus four lambda plus four. And the result is that therefore lambda minus two squared is equal to zero. So these eigenvalues are not correct. By the way, don't forget the fun facts, right? The lambdas should add up to the trace of the matrix. Zero plus four is the trace of this matrix. So these lambdas should have been two and two. I'm so sorry, that was just a, a sign error on my part. And it really is important to get the lambdas right. You know, when I had the lambdas wrong and I was starting to put the matrix into, I was starting to think about the numbers that were gonna go into the matrix, I realized that I wasn't gonna be able to cross off a row, but I know that I have to be able to do that. So this is a way to catch yourself. Just like I more or less, well, Gustavo caught me just in time too, but I was just about to realize that my lambdas were wrong because I was coming, gonna come up with a matrix where I could not cross off a row. This is just advice for next Tuesday's midterm, is that you have to be able to cross off a row, and if you don't see that you can, then something might be wrong, and you need to make sure you double check your lambdas, okay? Just like we did right there. That was actually a, a, a good mistake in a sense, because it shows you that sometimes you might get the lambdas wrong and need to catch yourself. Okay, so I'm gonna subtract two from the main diagonal of the matrix A. So here it is, and when I subtract two from the main diagonal, I sure do get the two rows are multiples of each other, so I'm just gonna cross off one of them. It doesn't really matter which one. And by the way, you can also just divide through by two right here. So I can change this to a one and a one if I want, okay? And I can immediately go to my vector, I'll call it V1, my vector V1, which is negative one, one. How did I get that? Well, do you remember my little trick I was, I was explaining on Tuesday? If I have, you know, I've crossed off a row and I have two numbers A and B right here, in a, in a row, when it's just a two by two matrix, you can do this. You can, just simply make your eigenvector to be negative B and A. So that's exactly what I did right here, negative B and A. I just switched the one and the one and put a minus on the first one. You can actually put this minus here on the A if you prefer to, it doesn't really matter because that'll just be a multiple of this vector. Any multiple of an eigenvector is just another eigenvector, which means it's fine, right? So for example, if you didn't divide through by two and you came up with the vector negative two, two, that's also correct. 
Okay, so there's more than one right answer here for what the eigenvector is. I could use negative 10, 10, right? As long as it's a multiple of this one, it's gonna be acceptable. Okay, so what we have is the information to build our first solution. So our first solution is x1 of t, and this is going to be e to the 2t times negative 1, 1. And I'm going to just kind of put that off on the side in the corner like that. Okay, that's x1 of t. Now, the question is, what are we going to do to get x2? <laughs> All right, I'm going to go ahead and erase this um, most of this board. Uh, the matrix, I'm going to recopy that so I can use it in a minute. There's my matrix A. Okay, so let me explain. We didn't get we didn't get a second eigenvector. This eigenvalue did not pull its weight. A is defective here. The matrix was defective. And so the question now is, all right, we got x1, but how do we get x2? We have to have two solutions for a two by two linear system. Okay, so how to get x2 of t? That's the question. This is what the new material is in uh, section 9.5. Okay, well, I'm going to... <laughs> I'm going to do something I've done many times before. The answer to this question, whether you like it or not, the answer to this question is to guess the form of the solution. <laughs> okay? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to guess. So or in other words, we use a trial solution. And it's going to be x2 of t equals so this is just a guess you guys don't have to really know where this comes from this is just uh, in the background theory of of systems of differential equations that this is this is what's going to work so we're going to take e to the lambda t whatever that is and we're going to multiply it by what's called w1 plus t times w2 Okay, so this is very important right here, this formula. Okay, um, and this is where W1 and W2 are to be determined. And I'm going to show you right now how to determine them. Guys, when we were back in chapter 8, and we had a repeated root to the auxiliary equation. You might remember, you know, like if we got something like r equals 2 and a 2, we would have like, you know, e to the 2x. And then to handle repeats, remember how we were stacking x's in front of whatever we had before? Okay. It's just not that simple in chapter 9. We can't just take this first solution up here and stack a T in front of it. That turns out not to work. So we have a slightly more complex trial solution that we're going to have to live with in chapter nine. And this is the form that it's gonna have. You're gonna to wanna to know this uh, general form right here, this box, because this is, this is really critical. Now, how am I gonna determine what W1 and W2 are? I'm going to show you right now. We are simply going to plug this um, proposal into our linear system. So we're going to plug x2 into x prime equals ax. So this is our, this is our uh, big problem we're trying to solve in chapter 9, x prime equals ax. We're going to plug x2 into it and see if it tells us what w1 and w2 are. So I have to take the derivative on the left side. So I'm going to take the derivative of this thing right here, okay? So the derivative of x2 is going to be the first term, that's e to the lambda t, times the derivative of the second term with respect to t, that's just w2. 
okay? Plus the second term, which is the part in parentheses, times the derivative of the first term. So lambda e to the lambda t times w1 plus t w2, okay? This is just the product rule. This is just literally the, there's a multiplication right here. We're just doing a multiplication in this X2 trial solution. So we're taking the derivative of that. The first term times the derivative of the second plus the derivative of the first term times the second. And that is supposed to be equal. I'm going to set that equal to capital A. So now I'm looking at the right side, capital A times X2. So A e to the lambda t times W1 plus t W2. Hopefully you guys can read that okay there. A little bit tight on the board space there. Okay, uh, we're gonna try to study this equation really quickly and figure out what happens. Notice that all of the e to the lambda t's can be totally canceled, right? You've got one in every single term, so just go ahead and cancel them. The next thing I'm gonna do is I am going to sort of match up the left side and right side of this equation. Okay, so let me come back up to the top and do that. What I have on the left side, I'm gonna group it like this. I have W2 plus lambda W1, and then I have plus T times lambda W2. Okay, so that's just multiplying out everything here on the left side. And on the right side, I'm going to multiply that one out as well. I have AW1 plus, I think I am going to just get rid of this for the moment. <laughs> All right, I'll rewrite this information back up here in a minute. But I just need a little bit of room to derive this. T times AW2. Okay, so I've just kind of cleaned up this equation at the bottom right here. And this is what I get. Notice that I have a, a part that doesn't have T and then a part that does have T equal to a part that doesn't have T and a part that does have T. Let's match them up. Let's match them up. The T terms, the T terms, what do they tell me? Uh, lambda W2 equals A W2. That should look famously familiar. Do you remember A V equals lambda V? <laughs> That's basically what this is. This is saying that W2, remember this is what's to be determined is W1 and W2. W2 is an eigenvector. Okay, so that's good information to know. And then we also have the other terms which tell me that uh, lambda W1 plus W2 has to agree with A W1. Okay, I'm gonna rewrite both of these right now, okay? I'm just gonna come over to the right and do this. I'm gonna rewrite these just slightly. This first equation can be rewritten as A minus lambda I times W2 is equal to zero. So I had to insert the identity matrix here because I can't just take lambda subtracted from A. It doesn't make sense to subtract a number from a matrix. But if I take the number lambda and turn it into a matrix by multiplying by the identity matrix, which is like multiplying by one, then I get a, a sensible equation. Okay, something that makes sense. Okay, so A minus lambda I times W2 becomes zero. Let's do something similar with the second equation. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take again A minus lambda I times W1, and that is equal to W2. 
So if you solve the second equation for W2, this one right here, if you solve this for W2, it equals A minus lambda I times W1. Okay? So this is messy, and this is not going to be as easy to remember as you might like. So I have a much better way to remember this, and it's a picture, and it's not in the book. So you're going to want to write this down, okay? So here it is. Here it is. Again, if you've lost track of what we're doing right now, we're trying to build this X2 solution. And we've got a form that we've been told to propose, but we'd have to know what are W1 and W2. So here is my picture that is going to help us to figure out what choice of W1 and W2 should we use. I'm going to draw a dot right here, and I'm going to label it with W1. And I'm going to draw an arrow. And every time I draw one of these, I, I guess I could call it an arc or an arrow. But every time you see an arc like that, it means multiply by this matrix, A minus lambda I. Okay, so this is just a, a visual to help you remember the calculations that are at the top of the board. So if we take A minus lambda I and we multiply it to W1, we're supposed to get W2. Okay. And if, so that's what this equation says right here. Yeah. So A minus lambda I times W1. Remember, you apply the matrix, you get W2. What if you apply that matrix again? What if we now take W2 and we apply A minus lambda I to that? Well, this equation here at the, at the top tells you that A minus lambda I times W2 is supposed to be zero. This picture tells you everything you need to know, right? It basically says the following, that W1 and W2 are related by this diagram. Now notice that we're not going to choose W2. W2 is going to come once we've decided what W1 is. So on your diagram, you might write the word choose over here for me. We're going to choose what W1 is, OK? We're going to make that choice ourselves. Once we've chosen W1, then how do we figure out what W2 is? Well, we multiply by A minus lambda I, OK? I hope it's kind of making sense. Once you've got W2 and W1, you can, of course, write down what X2 is, and you've got your second solution. OK, this is how this works. We're going to practice this, of course. Just want to get the outline of it to you to begin with. Now, how do you choose W1? Like, what, is, what, are, what are the rules about how to choose W1? Well, the first rule is that whatever you choose W1 to be, it should at least survive this first matrix. It should survive long enough to give me a W2. And by the way, I don't want W2 to be zero. Because if, if it turns out if W2 becomes zero, then you're going to lose this second part of the solution over here. And your X2 is actually going to basically be the same as the X1 that we got for the first solution. We don't want that. We need a second linearly independent solution right now. So please do not choose W1 to be something that will immediately collapse to zero right away. It really just means choose W1 to be something that will survive this matrix. When I say survive this matrix, I just mean when you multiply by this matrix, W1 does not become zero, right? Or to use another language, W1 is not in the kernel of this matrix, if you want to think about linear transformations, right? So W1 does not become zero. However, if we apply the matrix twice, so if we start with W1 and we apply A minus lambda I squared, W1 should end up becoming zero. 
So W1 needs to survive one power of this matrix, A minus lambda I, but not two powers of it. That's the requirement, right? So choose, I'll write it here, W1 so that A minus lambda I of W1 is not zero, but a minus lambda i squared of w1 is zero. Okay, so this is the this is the way to say it in words, but I never remember this notation. I always just remember the picture. The picture is great for this, okay? So let me um, let you look at that for a second. Let me know if there's any questions about this. This is the theory behind it. We just have to now practice it. We have to go back and practice it. So I'm gonna go back to the uh, example from a few minutes ago, which I did have to erase. This was our matrix. We got lambda equal to two and two with an eigenvector of negative one and one. Okay, and so our first solution, I'm just recopying what was up here before I explained this defective part to you. So there you have a, a recap of how far we've come with the, this uh, example so far. And now I want to finish the problem by finding x2. So let me also note that A minus 2i, that's the matrix that um, we're going to need to, to look at here. This was the matrix A minus 2i. When I subtract 2 from the main diagonal of A, I just get this one. And this is the matrix that really matters in the diagram. See, A minus lambda i is here and here. So I have to right now, I have to choose a vector w1. This is, the, this is how I'm going to get x2. I have to choose w1 to survive this matrix, but not survive the square of this matrix. So it turns out it's not a bad idea to just go ahead and square the matrix. So a minus 2i squared. I'm going to save you a little headache on that and tell you what the answer is. So if you square this matrix, you're going to actually get the zero matrix. In the two by two case, it turns out that's always what will happen in this defective analysis. You'll always get the zero matrix. Okay, the, the nice thing about that is that now when you're choosing your w1 and you want it to survive this matrix but you want it to not survive this matrix well you don't have to worry about it surviving this matrix it can't <laughs> nothing can survive the zero matrix if you take a zero matrix and multiply it on the right by any vector whatsoever that vector is a goner right <laughs> that vector is going to be completely zero because all of the entries of the matrix are zero Okay. Okay. Is everybody so far so good? Any questions yet? Okay. Um, so I have to choose a W one now, and here's what we're gonna here's what we're gonna do, guys. It's just a vector, right? It's just a column vector. What am I gonna choose? I'm gonna choose a vector that will survive this matrix right here. When I multiply this matrix by this vector, I don't want to get zero, zero. It turns out you can usually do this very, very easily. For example, if I just choose one, zero, okay, it's going to, it's going to be really easy to see that this is going to work. Let me just show you. So if I do that, then A minus 2i times W1 is just negative two, negative two, 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 and one, zero. And when you multiply that out, when you actually do this multiplication now, you take a minus two i times w one times one, zero, you're gonna actually just pick off, 
you end up just picking off the first column of the matrix. When you choose one zero, that will always happen. <laughs> and since the first column of your matrix is not all zeros, you get a perfectly good vector here for W2. Okay. Now guys, this is not the only choice for, that you could have picked for W1. You could have picked lots of different things. As long as when you multiply this matrix by your choice, you don't get zero, zero. Okay, and whatever you do get is what we're calling W2, right? Remember, A minus lambda I, here's the picture, A minus lambda I times W1 is supposed to be equal to W2. Okay, so there are lots of correct choices, and now I'm gonna write down the answer here is x2 of t is e to the 2t times w1, which I chose to be 1, 0, plus t times w2, which is negative 2, 2. So, so there it is. Okay, this is x2 right there. And so my final answer to this problem, I'm going to write it over here, the general solution. Okay, so the general solution is as follows. Um, X of T equals C1 E to the 2T times negative 1, 1. This is just the first term, right? C1 times the first solution. Let me just pull this in a little bit for you here. Okay, so C1 times the first solution. The first solution is just what I'm copying from this box. And then plus C2 times the second solution, which is just right over here. E to the 2T times 1, 0 plus T times negative 2, 2. Okay. Guys, you might remember that when we were deriving the, the, you know, the W1 and the W2, we made the observation that W2 is supposed to be an eigenvector. Look what we got for W2 here in this example, right? Negative 2, 2. Do you see that that's just a multiple of the eigenvector V1 that we had gotten originally? Yeah, so that's not a, that's not a coincidence. This W2 vector, when you calculate it, is always an eigenvector. And in this problem, all of the eigenvectors are just the multiples of negative 1, 1. So getting negative 2, 2 for W2 should be reassuring. It, it makes me feel good that we have a reasonable answer there. Now you might be wondering, would it be okay to just change negative 2, 2 to negative 1, 1. Can I take the, you know, if, if W2 is supposed to be an eigenvector, can I just steal this one again? The answer is no, you cannot actually do that. Because your W2, remember, has to be correlated with W1. So if we chose W1 to be 1, 0, and we do this calculation for what W2 should be, we have to live with it. We have to leave W2 exactly as we find it. We can't change it to some other multiple. So that's why you saw me leave this as negative 2, 2. I didn't change it back to negative 1, 1 again in the second part of my solution here. Okay, are there any questions on this example? Okay, uh, I'm gonna do a couple of three by three examples now. Um, by the way, in this section, I will not ask you anything bigger than a three by three. Okay, I'm going on record. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to do defective linear systems for matrices larger than three by three. Now that has an interesting consequence because 
that actually means that there will be no complex numbers in this section. Because think about it, to have a defective matrix with complex eigenvalues, what would you have to have? A plus and minus BI repeated at least twice, right? You have to have repeats in order to have a defective matrix. So your matrix won't be defective if there's no repeats. And so for complex numbers, A plus BI, A minus BI, if they repeat, we get another A plus BI, A minus BI, and that's four lambdas now, which means your matrix would have to have been at least four by four. So I'm kind of actually, by telling you that I will only ask you for two by two and three by three examples, I'm basically promising you that in this section at least, you won't see any complex eigenvalues. There will be no complex numbers to deal with. Okay, but let's look at the three by three case to see what uh, can happen there. There are a few uh, changes for the three by three case that I wanna, that I wanna go through with you real quick. Is everybody getting this all right so far? This is, the la this is the last heavy section of the whole entire semester. The, the section we're gonna do next week is, is a pretty easy one, doesn't have a lot of, of surprises to it. This is the section we've gotta get down, okay? And we've gotta get it down before, before our exam. So let me, do, let me talk about the case of a three by three. So if A is a three by three defective matrix, Now, for a three by three defective matrix, there's actually more than one way to sort of have this defectiveness show up, right? So I'm gonna call, there's, there's gonna actually be three cases. Case one, uh, I'm gonna call this the mixed eigenvalue case. Mixed eigenvalue. And what this is, is where you have lambda one, and then you have another lambda that repeats. So I'm gonna say maybe lambda one, and then lambda two, and lambda two. And we get our eigenvector V1 right here that goes with lambda one. But let's suppose that the second eigenvalue does not pull its weight. Right, let's suppose that that happens. In this situation, how do you get your solutions to your, to your linear system? Remember, you have to have three solutions now. In a three by three problem, you'll have three terms in your general solution. So we're expecting three terms. What are they gonna be? Well, x1 of t, that's just gonna be e to the lambda one t v1, okay? And then x2 of t, well, that's just going to be e to the lambda 2t v2. And then how am I going to get my, my third solution here? Well, that's where we have to use the material that we've just been learning. So for x3, we're going to need e to the lambda 2t times w1 plus tw2. And it's exactly the same diagram that we just used on the last two by two case. So this is how you handle the mixed eigenvalue case. You just basically go through, write down these three solutions. You will have to do your whole w business to get that third solution. That's case one. All right, case two, case two is the one that I usually will refer to as regular. So it's like a regular defective scenario. What is this scenario? This is the scenario, this is the scenario where we get the same lambda three times, okay? We get the same lambda three times and we get two eigenvectors, let's say V1 and V2. So this is defective because 
lambda has a weight of three and only gave us two eigenvectors. So in this case, uh, how am I gonna get my solutions here? Well, x1, this is gonna be just e to the lambda t times v1, and x2 is just gonna be e to the lambda t times v2. Okay, so, so far the, with the first two vectors, we can just do this, right? <laughs> So we can just uh, build these solutions. Even though it's the same lambda, the fact that the vectors are different, these are two linearly independent eigenvectors, means that these two solutions are good to go. We don't have to do any of the defective business so far. But for the third solution, this would be x3 of t, I'm gonna be using e to the lambda t, times, here we go again, w1 plus t times w2, all right? So it's exactly the same again as what we did in the two by two case. I will note one quick thing here about this though. The w2, remember that it's always an eigenvector? In this case, it might not be just a multiple of the first eigenvector or the second eigenvector, it might be some linear combination of those eigenvectors, right? So just be aware of that. It's not always just a multiple. In the two by two example, I know that we our W2 was just a multiple of the, of the eigenvector. Here, W2 could be a slightly less obvious linear combination of those two eigenvectors, okay? So this is case two, right? And then finally, I'm going to erase the, the mixed eigenvalue case and mention the last, the last situation. This is the one that is, um, is the, in some ways, the worst one. Case three uh, is what I like to call super defective. This is the super defective case, and I do want you to be able to do it. Um, I have been known to ask these on my, on my exams. How does this look? Well, this is where you get the same lambda three times, but it is super defective. It only gives you one eigenvector, <laughs> okay? So how do you handle that situation? Well, for the first solution, what you're going to do is you're going to write e to the lambda t times v. That makes sense, right? You just form the, the easy solution with the eigenvalue and eigenvector. But remember, you have to have three solutions. So my second solution is going to be, as you could expect, e to the lambda t times w1 plus t times w2. Okay, with the same W's that we talked about before. And now finally, how are we going to get a third solution? It turns out we have to really dig deep into the bag now. And I'm gonna write it down right here and then I'll talk about it. Basically, the form of X3 is gonna be E to the lambda T times, here we go, W3 plus t times w4 plus one half t squared times w5. What the heck, <laughs> right? This is the super defective case. There's a w3, a w4, and a w5 that you have to deal with. Let me uh, quickly just show you what, the w, what those w's are referring to there. Basically, this is a trial solution again, and you take that trial solution and you plug it back into your system and you match up the terms on both sides of the equation like we were doing earlier, and you come up with the following diagram, okay? So, um, yeah, so no, I, so these are formulas that I want you guys to learn, 
And again, it'll be easy to, to, to get them straight as long as you have the diagram that goes with them. So let me draw a diagram here for this so you can see how it's going to look. You always start with W3 here at the left, and I'm gonna draw these arcs. Remember, every time I go across an arc, I'm going to multiply by A minus lambda I. So I'm gonna start at W3, I multiply by A minus lambda I to get W4, and then I multiply by A minus lambda I again to get W5, and then I multiply by A minus lambda I again, and I'm supposed to get zero. So this, in this situation, this super defective case, we actually are going to be choosing W3 over here on the left. And what do we have to know about it? Well, it has to be chosen to survive two powers of A minus lambda I. So you have to square A minus lambda I. W3 has to survive that matrix. But W3 should not survive the cube of the matrix. That's why there's three arcs here leading to zero. So whatever W3 is, is going to survive two powers of the matrix, but not three powers. Okay? It's a little bit of, it's the same principle as in that simple two by two example that we did, but it's just a little bit messier from a, from a mathematical point of view. I do want you to learn these formulas, guys. I want you to be able to put these pieces of the solutions together. I know it seems weird. We have this one half T squared sitting here. Um, it turns out you have to do that to make this form of this trial solution work out, okay? I'm not going to, like, show you the theory behind this diagram for the X3 case. I think showing it to you already for the 2x2 two two case kind of gives you the idea of where it's coming from. Um, and it's not that interesting for me to just like rederive that in the three by three case. A much better thing for me to do right now is going to be to do an example. So I'm going to do an example and then we'll take a break. After I'm done with the example, we'll take a little break. Okay. So let's do an example. I'm actually going to do a super defective example. Okay. To, 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 to start off with. Okay. Again, if you need to look back at any of this, I am recording today's uh, class, so you'll be able to, to do that. Um, so here's an, an example. Solve x prime equals, and well, let me just write it this way. x prime equals ax, where capital A is the following matrix. Here it comes negative 1, 1, 0, and negative 2, negative 3, 1, and 1, 1, negative 2. Okay, let's try this problem. This will be a great chance to practice what we've been learning. And this is the kind of thing I could put on a test uh, next week. So let's, let's, let's really try to get the handle on this one. Now, this matrix does not have very many zeros in it. So I'm just going to give you a hint here, and I might do this next week as well. I might basically tell you the lambdas. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you, let's suppose I told you these two lambdas, just these two. Would you be able to figure out the third one? Have to remember, back to chapter seven, right? We have the fun facts for our eigenvalues. You really want to know those for, for next week, right? So the, the reason is that the trace of this matrix, the trace of this matrix is negative one plus negative three plus negative two, which is negative six. So that means that my three lambdas have to add up to negative six. And so absolutely my third lambda is also negative two, okay? Got that. So we've got our lambda. Let's do our null space. 
and let's find out what kind of a situation we're in here. I'm going to add one to the main diagonal of this matrix. I'm sorry, I'm going to add two to the main diagonal of this matrix. So when I do that, when I add two to the main diagonal of the matrix, I'm going to get that null space right there. So this matrix, by the way, we need to keep track of this one. This is A minus lambda i. In other words, this is the matrix A plus 2i. It's definitely not invertible. You can see that the third row is, the, is a multiple of the first row, so I'll cross it off. If I do my row operations here, I'm going to take the negative, I'm going to take two times the first row and add it to the second row, and I'm going to get something like this. Okay, so just add two times the first row to the second row, and this is what you end up with. And now you can pretty quickly see that your eigenvector, right, if you, if you use a t, if you use a t on the, on the uh, z variable, the y variable is just the negative of that which would be negative one. And then if y is negative one, then from the first equation, x is one. So your eigenvector is one, negative one, one, and that's the only eigenvector. This is super defective, right? The same lambda three times, but only one eigenvector. Super defective. This is super defective, all right? So there, there you have it. So in the super defective case, you know, I'm gonna have to work pretty hard to get my solutions. Now, um, of course, we know one solution, right? We can write, maybe I will, it's problems like this where I really wish I had a larger board. <laughs> um, there's my matrix. Let me put my first solution right up here. This is just going to be e to the negative 2t times 1, negative 1, 1, right? This is just e to the lambda t times v. So that's x1. Now, to figure out x2 and x3, we're going to need all of that w business that I was explaining earlier. So for that, um, you know, I'm going to need to find powers of this matrix, right? So I'm going to need to work out, down here I might do that, a plus 2i squared. I'm just going to square this matrix. And I want to be clear about this. I cannot square the row reduced version. I have to actually square out the original matrix before I did any row reduction. So it's just literally this matrix that we came up with times itself. Okay, and I'm gonna basically skip working this all out. I'm just gonna tell you what the answer is here. So you're just taking this matrix times itself, and I just wanna emphasize again, it's this matrix A plus 2i, not the row reduced version. Do not use the row reduced version to figure out the square of the matrix. So uh, when we square this out, uh, here is what you'll get. I'll just ask you to take my word for this one. Negative one, zero, one, one, zero, negative one, and negative one, zero, and one. Okay? So that should be correct if I have done my math properly. Um, yeah, that looks good to me, okay? And we also need to cube this matrix. <laughs> so there's a little bit of work here. Now, the nice thing is that when you cube a super defective matrix, when you, when you do the cube of this matrix, it turns out you're always going to get all zeros here. I promise you, this will always happen. <laughs> Right, just like for the two by two example, you might remember when we did a minus lambda i squared, we got the all zero matrix there as well. So that's exactly what happens here too. We're gonna get this all zero matrix out of this, okay? So let me draw my diagram now. I'm gonna go ahead and erase this uh, null space calculation here. 
Okay, so let me draw my diagram. I am actually gonna start with the W3 diagram, and then here's W4, and then here's W5, and then that's going to zero. Okay, and I'm gonna start by working on W3. So you might be wondering, why am I not doing W1 and W2 yet? I'll, you'll see why in a second, because I have a nice little trick that is actually very handy for that. Let me choose the W3 first, okay? What am I choosing here? I am choosing a vector. I am gonna choose a vector that will survive two powers of my matrix, right? So here's where we put the matrix. Every single time we go across an arc, it's like multiplying by the matrix. I need to choose a W3 that will survive this matrix. This is the square, right? But will not survive this matrix. Well, nothing could ever survive this matrix. So I don't really have to think about that part of it. But I need to choose W3 to survive this matrix. I am just going to choose, again, I'm just going to choose 1, 0, 0. Okay? I'm choosing something that will, how do I know so fast that that vector will survive this matrix? Well, because I can see that if I put 1, 0, 0 right here, what happens is I pick off, I pick off the first column of the matrix, right? When you write multiply by 1, 0, 0, you just simply get that first column, which is not the zero vector. So that's great. That means I can choose this. Now, it's not the only thing I could choose. In this case, by the way, I would not want to choose 0, 1, 0. Um, let me see. Rayuko, I see you have a question. Shouldn't the 0 be a 1? Um, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Over here, you mean? Yeah, I'm sorry. So when I calculate this, this should be negative one, one, negative one. I'm sorry, is that not what I wrote? <laughs> yeah, it should just literally be the first column of this matrix here. Okay, sorry. <laughs> just making sure you guys are awake out there. <laughs> yeah. Um, notice that I should not choose zero, one, zero what would happen if I chose zero, one, zero, and I put that right here, zero, one, zero, I would be picking off the middle column of this matrix and that would be bad, right? That would be all zero on the far right and we don't want to get the zero vector over here. Okay, so, so anyway, uh, there are some, you have to be a little careful how you choose your Ws, but usually you can get it right. Now, if that's what W3 is, then the question you might want to know is, well, then what is W4? Follow the picture, right? We're going to take A minus lambda I. Now, that, that means I have to take the matrix A plus 2I. So that would have been this matrix right here. And I have to multiply that by 1, 0, 0. And when I do that, I pick off the first column of this matrix. So there is W4, 1, negative 2, 1. All right, and, and what is W5? W5 is, well, W5 is actually what you get when you apply A minus lambda I squared to 1, 0, 0 which is actually what I just did right here. This is A minus lambda I squared times one zero zero, which is W3. That's gonna give me W5. So W5 is negative one, one, negative one. Okay. So what do I have then? I, by the way, notice that this W5 is again an eigenvector. You see that it's just a multiple of the eigenvector that we got originally when we found that first solution? It's just the negative of this vector. So this is not a surprise, right? W5 has to be an eigenvector, and it's just a multiple of this eigenvector. 
So what do we have now? What we have is, what we have is x3 of t. Notice I have not talked about x2 yet. I have to come back. I'm going to say something about that in a second. So x3 of t is e to the negative 2t times w1, or sorry, w3, which is 1, 0, 0, plus t times w4. w4 is 1, negative 2, 1, plus, you remember the formula? 1 half t squared times w5, which is negative 1, 1, negative 1. Okay, so there at the bottom of this board is what W3 is. Okay, so this is just e to the lambda t times W3 plus t times W4 plus one half t squared times W5. Now, what about x2? <laughs> what about the second solution? This is a little, a little hint in the super defective case. If you lop off the left arc and you focus on just this part of the picture right here, you actually have a diagram that would apply for W1 and W2. You remember the smaller diagram that we used originally on the two by two matrix on that first example? Yeah, we can use that here. So what it means is that you can actually allow W1 and W2 to just be the same things as W4 and W5. You don't have to start over again to figure out W1 and W2 if you've already done W3, 4, and 5. So I'm going to take advantage of that. And x2 of t is going to be e to the negative 2t times w1. I'm going to re replace that with whatever w4 was, which is 1, negative 2, 1, plus t times w5, which is negative 1, 1, negative 1. So that saves you from having to you know, search for w1 and w2. You can just ignore the first arc and realize that the rest of the diagram looks the same as the one we drew earlier for W1 and W2. Okay, so guys, the board is a bit of a mess. Does everybody see here's X1, here's X2, and here's X3. If you are willing to just put those into boxes for me and make them easy for me to find, I will allow you on, uh, for example, on the exam next week, I will allow you to then just write your general solution. Instead of recopying, instead of recopying all the different boxes down, you can just do the following. X of t equals C1, X1 of t plus C2, X2 of t, plus C3, X3 of T. And now that will be perfectly fine, okay? Because otherwise you're gonna have to write all of this again, all of this again, and all of this again. So this is just a shortcut at the end to just basically pull it all together. Kind of like what we did in chapter eight when we did step three of our three-step process. I always said, yeah, it's fine if you just wanna write, you know, Y of X equals y sub c of x plus y sub p of x, and just put a box around it, that's perfectly good. Okay, um, this is only an example of the super defective case. There are other, there are the two other cases, right? There's the regular defective and the mixed eigenvalue defective. You need to be able to do all three of these cases, okay? And I believe in the homework, you'll see at least one example of each of those three cases. So be sure to do the homework for Saturday. And um, I was gonna do another, oh, so I have a video. Okay, this is the other thing I was gonna mention. On the videos tab of my website, 
I posted some individual videos. I think each one of them is about a 13 minute video with examples of the different types that we've talked about. So I think there's a super defective one. It might even be the same one that I just did here. But I also have a video, I may not have one for the regular defective case because that one's not too complicated, but the mixed eigenvalue case, I think I have one there as well uh, that you could watch um, on your own. And I might say a little bit more about it too uh, later on in today's class. But what I'd like to do now, uh, if, if, there's no question, if there's questions, I'm happy to take questions here on this. Um, otherwise, I'd love to take a break until 1.25. When we come back from the break, I'm gonna talk about the midterm. And um, I might also, well, it depends on what you guys, if you guys have questions on the homework for Saturday that you already would like to ask me, during this break between now and 125, maybe you could write down those, or type those questions in for me so I have an idea if people want to look at some of those problems. Okay, so why don't we do that? And then when we come back from the break, we're definitely going to talk about the exam, how we're going to run it, what it's going to cover, how you should study, blah, 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 all that stuff. So let's take a break at 125 sharp. I'm going to be back and we're going to continue. Okay. Thanks, guys. See you in a few minutes.
Okay, I, I hope that you guys are all there and uh, back from a, a quick little break. Um, yeah, so uh, what I'd like to do with the 25 minutes right now that we have is um, talk a little bit about the midterm and uh, how things are going to work. So I, I started by writing it on the board, uh, but I'm gonna quickly in a minute, I'm gonna share my screen with you and we're just gonna do it a slightly different way. Our midterm is next Tuesday. And I'm going to try and run it almost exactly the same way that we ran the second midterm, if you remember, which was right before spring break. What that means is I'm going to be emailing you guys the midterm uh, shortly before noon, before our class time on Tuesday. I'm going to try to have it over to you by 1140, 1145, somewhere in there. I'm sending it to you early because I don't want you to lose exam time while you're trying to print it and get yourself set up with, with that and getting into your email and everything else. So uh, I'm gonna send it to you early and if you can uh, get to your email ahead of time and you're ready to go, you can start working on it as soon as you're ready to go. So what I'm saying is, uh, try to be a little bit early so that you can um, have a little extra time, basically. Uh, and also, in case there's any glitches with the email or with technology in any way, shape, or form, you know, you'll have time to get that solved before we're actually taking the test. So anyway, so a little bit before 12 o'clock, you'll be able to start. And you'll have the whole entire class period plus some extra time. I know a lot of people don't have class. I think nobody has a class that I know of until 2.30. So I'll let you work until 2.25. But remember also that at the end of the exam, you're going to need to compile your solutions into a file, uh, a PDF file that it, it, I should get one PDF from you dropped into a Dropbox folder. So I'll be sharing a Dropbox folder with you for the midterm. I'll probably send it over the night before or something or the morning of. But you'll have a Dropbox invite to submit that file into that Dropbox folder. Okay? Um, so that's how that's going to work. During the exam, uh, I don't want you to use any resources. That means uh, no internet, no notes, please don't use the book, um, don't use a calculator or a phone of any, you can use a phone at the end if you need to take some pictures to compile for me, but please don't use the phone as a, as a resource to solve the math problems during the test. I'm gonna be trusting you guys uh, just as I did on the last midterm to, to be as honest as possible and um, you know, don't discuss this with anybody. Don't call up your PhD math friend during the exam uh, to, to get their help. The best thing is gonna be if you can turn on your Zoom uh, and turn on your camera. Uh, I would like that. I know that it doesn't always work great. Uh, sometimes with poor internet, the cameras don't work that well. And some of you may not even have a camera necessarily, but to the extent possible, um, do everything you can to make me feel good that the exam was smooth. And one way to do that is to turn a camera onto yourself for the whole entire exam uh, in a way that you know I can tell that, that you're there working on the exam uh, as you're supposed to. Try to gather up some paper to, to, to write with uh, so that you can uh, write your solutions out. You're also welcome to print out the exam and write your solutions into the exam paper as well. Um, but just make sure that any extra paper, like scratch paper or anything like that, starts off totally blank. So you need to have blank paper for this, okay? Now I'm gonna supply you with a table of integrals and annihilators. That's actually going to be with the exam. So you don't need to print that page out yourself um, separately. Um, so please don't do that. The, the, the table of integrals and annihilators is on my website for you to look at so you kind of know what's on it. But I don't want you to print that out as a separate document in advance because I want to have you start off with a clean exam, right? That has that as one of the pages attached with it. 
Um, okay, so that's the main thing about the format of how the exam is going to work. I will be disabling the chat feature except for chatting with me. So you'll be able to send messages to me, but they won't be uh, messages going to everybody in the class at that time. Um, and if I need to make announcements, I might make them through chat as well, or if it's really important, I might turn my voice on for a moment. I'll try not to interrupt you guys during the exam. Um, so very much like the last time we did this, uh, I'm more or less planning to do the same procedure next time. Okay, are there any questions so far about the logistics of it? Before I get into the actual content for the exam, are there any questions on the, on the logistics that I just went over? Hi, Professor, I have a question. Uh, yes. I want to know that sometimes my printer don't print good. We can look at the question from the computer, right? Yes, that, that is fine. In fact, I know some of the other students don't have printers that they can uh, use. So if that's the case, you're more than welcome to have it up on your screen. I don't mind, guys, I don't mind if you have your phone or your computer like turned on and with you, if you're needing to use that to access your email or to, to post up the exam for yourself to look at, that's fine. I just don't want you using the internet to solve the math problems, that's all, okay? okay. So I understand the challenges of this. Uh, you know, it's probably hasn't gotten any easier in, in the last month or so, so. Uh, we're going to do the best we can with, with this, and uh, that's why I'm trying to give you a little bit of a window of extra time in case there is something that doesn't quite go according to plan. We have a little bit of a buffer. Thank you. Sure. Are there other questions? Okay, uh, if, that's, if, it's, if that's clear, let me uh, just talk a little bit about what the exam is going to cover. There are four chapters that are going to be involved here. Starting back in chapter 6, 6.3 and 6.4, this was the sections about the kernel and the range of a linear transformation, as well as one-to-one -one and onto linear transformation. So you should, if I give you a linear transformation, I might ask you, you know, is it one to one, on to, both, or neither? And I might ask you to find a basis for either the range or for the kernel. Those sorts of questions are very standard when we're talking about uh, the last half of chapter six. Okay, so that goes back a ways. You, we we covered a lot of that stuff, um, you know, kind of uh, at least a month ago or so. And in fact, some of the stuff on the kernel. Uh, and the range and so on, I actually asked you to watch videos for. Those videos are still there on my website uh, and you're more than welcome to watch them again. And if you haven't really digested those fully, I would recommend that you go back to that again. That's older material. I find people sometimes struggle with this first part of this uh, topics for this midterm just because it's a little bit older and it also kind of got split up a little bit during the spring break time, okay? Then we have the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which we've been reviewing recently in chapter nine, actually. In fact, chapters seven and nine kind of go together, right? Um, defective and non-defective matrices, diagonalizing a matrix, if we can do that. Um, you know, th those, are the, those are the main things there. Uh, you should expect some theoretical questions having to do with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So for example, um, and we've seen these examples before, so you don't need to worry about, I hope, not, I hope you're not trying to like frantically write everything down that I'm saying, because you're going to find this stuff when you start reviewing. Um, but for example, there was a group work where uh, I asked you to give an example of two matrices that were both diagonalizable but then after you add them together, the result is no longer diagonalizable. That's like a theoretical question. Of course, there's the, there's the very famous equation, you know, A, V equals lambda V. There's no way that this exam won't have that on it, <laughs> right? You're gonna absolutely need to use that. And you should write this down, you know, on a solution, even if you don't really know the full solution to the problem. 
help me give you partial credit by writing down stuff like this on your paper that's relevant to a particular problem, even if you don't see fully how to do the whole problem, okay? These sorts of things will help you get some partial credit. Um, then we move into chapter eight. Uh, chapter eight was uh, fairly recent, and I don't think it's quite as hard for most people. You need to know the annihilators and variation of parameters approaches to solving higher order differential equations. That's really the, the, the most important thing. Remember, an nth order linear differential equation is going to have n linearly independent basis solutions, right? It's going to be n dimensional as a vector space. So you're going to be using the auxiliary equation, for example. That's one way to get those basis solutions. And then uh, if it turns out that it's a non-homogeneous equation, you would use either annihilators or variation of parameters to determine that particular solution. Okay. So don't forget the three-step process, right? Step one, find the complementary function. Step two, find one particular solution to the, to the non-homogeneous equation. And then step three, just write down the final answer. Okay, so that's something that, that we've practiced a lot, okay, in recent times. I might ask you to check that some functions are linearly independent. We have a Ronskian for that. Remember, we just learned recently about something called the Ronskian. And so, uh, of course, you can use the Ronskian to test for linear independence of those functions. Okay, and then finally, we have the stuff that we've been covering for about the last uh, three classes or so in chapter nine. I say 9.1, you know, I probably really should say nine. This is really, really 9.2. I didn't really do much in 9.1. It's sort of just an introduction, if anything else. Um, and the techniques in 9.1, I never really went over. So you can focus on 9.2 through 9.5. It does include 9.4 and 9.5 that we've been doing this week. And uh, both of those sections have a lot to them, right? So you have to definitely study well on the stuff that we just are learning now um, so that you're on top of that. I would say that this exam is going to be about 25% on each of those four chapters, approximately, okay? And remember that chapters seven and nine go hand in hand. So about half of this midterm is going to rely on you guys being able to find eigenvalues and eigenvectors, figure out if a matrix is defective or not, and then do something with all that information, right? So there's, there's a lot to, to make sure that you are on top of for that. Okay, um, let me just really quickly share my screen with you here for a second. Um, hopefully you can see my, my screen. This is a document that is on my um, 250B midterm three resources. This is an informational handout about the midterm. And you can see there that I have some extra office hours listed. I wanted to add uh, one more extra office hour. Of course, I have office hours today. Maybe you can see my little screen on the side here as well. I am going to have some extra office hours tomorrow as well, starting at 5 p.m. and going pretty much, <laughs> pretty much all night. All right. So if you're working on the homework, for example, that's due on Saturday, or if you're doing any studying already by tomorrow, this says Friday at 5 p.m. I'm going to be in my Zoom office hours, right? So I've put the meeting ID number there on my uh, review packet, and you could just drop on in, and we can talk one-on-one -on -one as much as you would like, okay? So make sure you get this defective and non-defective linear systems stuff down by Saturday. That's for Saturday's homework. And my Friday office hours are a great time. If you can't come later today, come tomorrow, and I'll be happy to help you out with this stuff that we've just been learning, okay? So that, that's something to keep in mind. 
I also posted the review session. It's a three hour video <laughs> from the last time that I taught this class. So um, you're gonna see a video of me wandering around in McCarthy Hall from about four months ago. And um, instead of doing a review session, uh, kind of through Zoom like this, where I have to sit on the floor and break, break my back for three hours. I think I'm just going to have you watch that review session and get as much out of that as you can. I do have um, the problems that I'm going to do in that review session. Those are posted also on these midterm three resources. But you can just sit back uh, and take some notes and really try to focus and study with me uh, with that virtual review session. Now I am going to have some office hours Sunday and Monday to help you guys get ready uh, sort of live office hours as well for the exam. So um, as of right now, I've got them both starting at 8 p.m. on Sunday night. Um, if I need to change anything, I will let you know uh, about that. I might be able to have slightly earlier hours on Monday as well. Um, and then I should also mention, I, I guess I forgot to put this here too, Tuesday morning before the exam, I'm gonna be in, in the Zoom office hours as well. So there should be lots of time to reach out to me uh, today, tomorrow, um, Sunday and Monday, I've got a lot of office hours. So feel free to, to stop on by. Okay, the rest of this handout is really just, you know, the usual, here's the checklist of everything that you should be able to do. And so just go through that list, kind of make sure you're comfortable, literally check it off as you go. And then these are some extra practice problems here um, that, you, that you may or may not wanna try. I see a here's, a, here's a three by three linear system right there. I bet that one's defective if I'm, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Um, anyway, so there's a bunch of problems here. You don't have to do all of these by any means. Uh, what I think would be even better than that would probably be to try the sample exam. So there's a sample midterm that you can um, look at from last semester as well. That's already posted for you. And uh, I would sit down with that maybe after you do the review session. Um, you could try that sample test and see how that goes. Um, and then if you need more help uh, based on that, you certainly can come back and reach out to me again. Like I said, on Sunday or Monday, I should be, um, I should be around uh, for, those, for those extra office hours. Okay, um, are there any questions so far? Is everybody with me up to this point at least? Okay, great. Also, uh, did, did anybody come up with any questions on the homework that's due on Saturday, did anybody start on that and already want to ask me something at this stage of the game or am I asking a little too early for that? Nothing at all? Okay, if not, oh, there is a question. Okay, yes, Aaron, number 20 on section 9.4. Um, again, before I get to that really quickly, let me go back. I just want to show you one other thing. I'm sharing my screen with you again here. Um, let me see if I can find it. If I go back to my website again, um, I've posted here. You can see, hopefully, there's a practice quiz uh, on chapters six, seven, and eight. I would recommend that you look at that. Um, and also, here's the midterm review stuff. Um, down at the bottom. So the review session and the three hours of video is down here for you guys to look at. So be sure to look at that. The other thing that I believe that I went through this in that review session video is this group work number 15. I'm not going to have time today to go through this. I had been intending to do that and I'm not going to have enough time. So you guys should probably try this one on your own, or as I said, I think I did go through it in the review session as well. Um, you can see that I've got some two by two linear systems here and I'm asking for things about the general solution and the phase portrait. It's mostly on chapter nine. Uh, and so I'd recommend that you take a look at that. Also, one other thing 
if I go back, um, yeah, let me go back here. In the 250B videos, hopefully you guys are getting the same screen that I'm showing. If you scroll down to the bottom of my videos, you see down here these, these last videos at the bottom? You're gonna probably wanna watch this 13 minute video on your own, the one that says mixed eigenvalue. The super defective one here that's underneath that I'm highlighting right now, I actually just, that one I did go over with you guys a few minutes ago before we took a break. But there are a couple of things about the mixed eigenvalue case that are worth watching that will catch you a little by surprise if you didn't watch it. So I would recommend spending 13 minutes later on watching that video, okay? So it's down on the bottom of the videos tab of my website. Okay, and you'll, you'll probably notice when you do in the homework that there's a mixed eigenvalue problem there, and you'll see, you'll see what I'm talking about. Let me, uh, let me look at problem number 20, uh, section 9.4. This is 9.4 number 20. We have a 2 by 2 linear system, and the coefficient matrix is this one right here. And we also have an initial condition, which is x of 0 equals 1, 1. Okay? And they're asking us to solve the, the system, basically. Okay? So the first step is, of course, to find the eigenvalues. So I'm going to subtract lambda off of the main diagonal of this. And you're very quickly going to realize that your lambdas, when you set the uh, characteristic equation to zero, or the, the uh, polynomial to zero here, that you get lambda equals plus or minus 4i. Right, plus or minus 4i. Can somebody tell me right now what the nature of the phase portrait is going to be? Is it going to be a source, a saddle, a sink, an unstable spiral, a stable spiral, or a circle? Should be there in your notes, right? So take a look at the lambda value. It's, it's imaginary, right? You only need to know the lambdas to get this, to get this correct. Yeah, you, the, those of you who are saying circle, it is a circle because there's no real part in front of the imaginary part. It's zero plus or minus four i. So the a value is zero. And so I would be expecting the, the solutions to this linear system to look like a circle shape, okay? Let's go ahead and, and try to work this out. So let's take lambda equals, 4i. I'm going to do the null space here. So that means I'm going to subtract 4i from the main diagonal of the matrix. So it's going to look like this when you subtract 4i. This is the matrix that you're going to be doing the null space of. Now remember, this matrix has to be not invertible. These two rows have to be multiples of each other. Actually, if you take the second row and multiply it by i, you'll get the first row. <laughs> okay, so I'm just going to cross off the second row, all right? And I'm going to use my little trick. I want you guys to start going really fast on this. See how fast you can do this. I'm going to use my little switch trick right here. Where Remember, remember you switch the positions. You put the four first, you put the negative 4i second, and then you change the sign of one of them. So I'm going to change the negative 4i to 4i, and then just put the 4 on top. Is everybody with me, or is that too fast? This is that, this is that thing I was talking about where if you've got a and b right here, you can make an eigenvector without, you don't have to bother with the free variables and busting stuff out or anything like that. You can literally just replace uh, the vector with the answer immediately. Switch the order of the two entries 
and put a minus sign on one of them. I don't really care which one you put the minus sign on. Okay, so there we go, we have that. And by the way, guys, I know I'm out of time. If you can hang out for just a couple more minutes, I'm gonna, I'll, I'll go as quickly as I can. If you have to go, you have to go. But let me see if I can finish this for those of you who can stay, okay? So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna make our solution e to the lambda t times v. So here it is, e to the lambda t times v. What I have to do is I have to write that, I have to floy this out, right? I have to write this, so I'm gonna write this as cosine of 4t plus i times the sine of 4t. That's this exponential part being written using the, you know, that Euler formula. So that becomes that. And then the four and the four I, remember how we're gonna split that up as well. The real parts, well, there's a four on top and there's no real part on the bottom. And then I gets multiplied by zero and four. Okay, so there you go. So we're taking the vector V and splitting it into a real and imaginary part. Now I have to floy this out, right? We have to do the floy thing. Floy, F-L-O-I. So when I take the, the first parts, I'm going to get cosine of 4t times 4, 0. And then when I take the last term, notice that I have i times i, which is negative 1. So that becomes a minus sine of 4t times 0, 4. Okay, so that's the first and the last, right? That's the F and the L of the foil. And then plus I times the outers and inners. I'm not gonna write them right there. I'm gonna write them in the, in the next step up here in the final answer. So we have the outers and inners there. So then my, my final answer, remember how you get your answer now, guys. Here is the first solution, and here is the second solution, right? The two, the two parts without the I, don't, don't write down I in your final answer, yeah? So we have this solution, and we're gonna have this solution. Let's look at what that's gonna be. So X of T equals C1 times the first solution. So let me write down the first solution again cosine of 4t times 4, 0 minus the sine of 4t times 0, 4. Okay, so that's just the first part of it. And then plus c2, c2 times the second solution, which is the outers and inners. So now I have enough room to write it down. Cosine of 4t would have been multiplied by 0, 4, and then plus sine of 4t times 4, 0. There is no i in this answer. There should not be, right? There should never be an i in, the, in this final answer. This is the general solution to the system. Okay, and then the just very last thing, just to wrap this up, I know I'm running out of, out of time here. They actually gave you an initial condition here, which was they gave you x of zero equals one, one. Right, so we actually can plug zero in for t everywhere and simplify it. So we're gonna get a c1 times four, zero, Remember that the sine of zero is just zero, so that's easy. This term doesn't matter, neither does that term. Okay, and then we have plus C2 times zero, four. So this just ends up giving me, you know, four C1 on the top line and four C2 on the bottom line. So 
what we conclude, I'm almost done, what we conclude is that C1 and C2 are both equal to one over four. Okay, and it asks you to sketch the, uh, the, the solution. It actually asks you to sketch the, the, the solution to this problem. So the interesting thing is that it is a circle. It actually is a circle. At time zero, the circle is gonna be going through the point one, one. But if you look at what this, um, what is this actual function here? Um, if I plug in one fourth for the constants, C1 and C2, I can literally just divide the vectors by four put the one fourth into the vectors. And so you end up just getting, um, you know, if we go across the top line of this vector, cosine of four T, and then if you go way over to here, you see plus sine of four T. And then on the bottom line, if we go across the bottom, we have minus the sine of four T plus the cosine of four T. So all I did is I just took this general solution, I plugged in a one fourth for C1 and C2, and I simplified what that whole vector was down to this. And it turns out that if you call this first slot X1 and you call the second slot X2, <laughs> it turns out that X1 squared plus X2 squared, it turns out, you can check this, I won't do it right now, but x1 squared plus x2 squared is just equal to 2. This is just a circle of radius square root of 2. Not a very good circle. You could probably draw it a whole lot better. It's a circle of radius the square root of 2. Okay? Does that make sense to everybody? I was a little fast there because I'm I know I'm running. Past uh, past class time here, but is this is there? Aaron, does that help? Are you still there? <laughs> uh, yeah, that helps. Okay, great. Yeah, you might have to check some of the details. Put the one fourth in here. Put the one fourth in here. Clean this up a little bit. Compress it into a single vector. It's just this. And if you take the top slot and square it, and take the bottom slot and square it and add the results, you're gonna get two. So this vector at all times t is a vector that has a radius of square root of two. All right, so that's number 20, and I'm glad we did it. It's a chance to practice the whole Floyd business. Um, if there are more questions, I'm gonna go over to my Zoom office hours. Uh, don't forget that I'll be around a lot, so I'll try to help you out. But do pay attention to this homework for Saturday so that you have a chance to practice the stuff from 9.4 and 9.5. And I'll see you guys again real soon. Thanks, thanks a lot for your attention today.